thank you. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. First of all, the, the, the place as such, the weather and everything, and also the honor of giving a sort of background. And that's when you realize, oh, shit, I'm old enough to do the background stuff, <laughs> uh, which is evident. Um, uh, these are my first impression innovations that I wrote down when I was asked to give this uh, talk. And I'm, I'm sure that everybody of you has said, oh, you missed my favorite subject and so on. But that tells a lot how many key innovations there are. And to the left, I've also pointed out uh, a time scale. This is starting when Björn Nilsson was in the lab. When, <laughs> yeah, you heard about the techniques that we were struggling with at that time. And I, I didn't come long after. Uh, but, and I will definitely go, not go through all of them, but it's totally remarkable how much life science and the way that it helps health and, and, uh, and environmental sciences depend on these innovations. And in the, in the bottom here, we will see things that I think will be covered by later speakers. But I've decided to just touch upon, I think it's five subjects, try to tie them together a little bit. And in fact, I, I, I will talk about DNA sequencing because it's one of the areas that has totally revolutionized several areas. And I think it's, it's today, 17 years ago, when the first genome was sequenced. And it was really a very, very big event. But it was also a little bit, uh-huh, what do we know more now? Okay, we, we consist of the genome encodes 20,000 proteins that we are all built up, uh, built up of. But what could we actually use it for? And I don't think that even at that time, we could imagine where we were heading with DNA sequencing. And I think many have seen this slide. Um, and, and, and in fact, I've seen that the estimation for the first genome was uh, close to 3 million US dollars. And I think it was around 40 labs around the world that helped. On this graph, it looks a little bit less expensive, but it's still a huge amount of money. And then in, in 2007, Jim Watson's genome, the guy who actually deciphered, together with co colleagues, how the DNA was actually made. His genome was sequenced. And, and that was actually technology that was sort of co-developed from our university then. And then, we were down to 3 million US dollars. It's still nothing that you can really imagine to use on a daily basis for small analysis. But at that time, also the tech, what we were talk, start talking about next generation sequencing, which is a little bit of a weird word in a say, next generation towards what? And, and then the price, the price started to fall for, for sequencing a full genome. And now the current, uh, Digit I got from, from Joachim Lundeberg at SciLife Lab, it, we are not really at SciLife Lab down to a $1,000 genome, but we are very, very close. But this includes the whole scale, from taking the sample, doing the sequencing, to using the bioinformatics uh, annotation and, and putting everything together. So suddenly, you are in a level where you can actually use it for routine analysis, as we will see. And uh, it's good that several of you have mentioned the SciLife Lab. I think it's an absolutely fantastic thing. Stefan I, and me happen to be in the small think tank uh, of the uh, Stockholm Science Theatre Foundation discussing this. And it was, fa in fact, looking back, quite easy to start thinking about using DNA sequencing as the first thing to promote this towards politicians. And so no, at least all Swedes in the audience knows that it's a national infrastructure for molecular bioscience. Uh, it took quite fast to establish it in, in, in May 2010. And from, two, oh, sorry, from 2013 then Uppsala joined. So it's actually two centers, but all researchers in, in life science in Sweden can use the, techno the equipment and the infrastructure and the bioinformaticians and so on. Otherwise, small Sweden, would have just started fighting between the university to, to get some of these genomics facilities and others. I call them toolboxes. It's a simple word, but easy to understand. It's today 1,200 resources. The, the uh, yearly governmental budget is big, but the total budget is it, far bigger since 
all good researchers, <laughs> and many good researchers want to move there. And we have also the uh, research fellow thing that Paul is part of, which I think is very, very important. And suddenly you can start thinking about DNA sequencing I in other means. First of all, with this sort of uh, quite obvious genetic disorders and infectious diseases, you have tools to really dig deep into this. And then I remember when the first cancer genomes were sequenced. I think these are the first. That's only eight years ago. And it was a big interest that three cancer genomes were sequenced. Uh, a bone cancer, a skin cancer, and a glioma cell line. And we could put the chromosomes in a line and, and actually uh, start looking how the gene fragments are thrown around when, when it's a cancer. Still, we are not really there when it's a next generation sequencing. But the sequencing uh, infrastructure equipment today is 10, 10 Illumina High Sec 10 for whole gene sequencing, 5 in Uppsala, 5 in Stockholm. And now things are moving really fast. And if we look in just quick snapshots into some areas, metagenomics. Metagenomics is when you actually sequence very many genomes at the same time and then using computers and algorithms to put the genomes together. And this is then headed at SciLife Lab by Anders Andersson, SciLife Lab Stockholm, I should say. And uh, they work a lot with tool development, but they do very different thing, looking at the, the microbiome at the Baltic Sea sediments and see how that changed geographically and in time and so on. And with the same technology, you can look, uh, look at the gut genome, our own bacteria in the gut. Or you can do really weird stuff looking into the moose rumen, vom in Swedish, uh, and, and look at these very interesting microorganisms that de degrade cellulose very efficiently. And you can use it to actually study water qu quality and check what micro microbes is there. Uh, just, I, I think the things you learn when you hear metagenomic uh, lectures are totally fantastic. I just reala re recently re realized that far more micro microorganisms and bacteria are discovered through metagenomics efforts than ever has been discovered from isolating bacteria. One of the reasons is that, that you actually uh, do not need to grow them, you just cultivate them. But if we, if we look into our own gut, an average person has about one kilo. That's 100 trillion cells, which is 10 times more than we have human cells. So all of us are more of a bacteria than a human. And uh, the av average gut, if we are in good shape, has approximately 100 to 1,000 species in there. Of course, then in different numbers and so on. And you can actually sample these and sequence the whole thing. So we all have a sort of fingerprint how our gut looks like in terms of bacteria at a certain time point. And if we turn unhealthy, this will change. And there is a strong belief, and this is one of the areas that I don't think we can say how it will look 10 years from now. How important will this be? Will we start making stool banks from when we are young so we can go back, back and recultivate our, uh, and, and so on. I will not go too deep into that now. Uh, <laughs> just before dinner, I will come back. Uh, clinical genomics, and, and now I, I feel a little bit shy here because I got this slide from, from Walter and Anna Videl, and Anna Videl is in the audience. But when I see this, I'm, I'm totally astonished. I actually had to call Walter back and said, is this true? Here you do whole gene sequencing to, to look at rare inherited diseases. Uh, the technology is the same, but there's two to five samples per day and 3,500 samples since start. Do you realize what that means? And a uh, 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 far majority of that is full genomes. So just in these clinical genomics facilities, we have sequenced maybe uh, 3,000 full genomes of mostly babies, I think. And we can then look at known genetic diseases, find novel disease mechanisms, and of course then find disorders where we hopefully can develop therapies for in the, f in the future. And how fast that grows, we cannot say, but this is to me major, major impact. Was it partly correct, Anna? Okay, <laughs> good. And then many, many genomes as such. 
and I just got this slide and I will not even try to go through it. It's totally amazing. We have basically sequenced everything I know of out there, uh, full genome. So that's, of course, amazing for envi uh, to understand the evolution and so on. Uh, and then part of what this led to, or, or already back 2001, uh, I worked very close with Matthias Ullén and we started discussing should, should we try to make antibodies dedicated uh, uh, specific tools to look where in the body is our proteins located? Because this was, we were white maps at this time, these times. Maybe we knew approximately what 10% of the proteins, what sort of protein they were, but not at all in what organ, what tissue, and not, not, not cells. And Matthias is an optimistic guy. He said, yes, let's try to get the funding. And Knut and Alice Wallenberg provided the funding, and it was 900 million Swedish crown on A4 contract, sort of. And we got started 2003. And some 120 employees, so it's 1,000 man years here. And the aim was, and what was the delivery, was validated antibodies recognizing each and every of these 20,000 proteins and not cross-reacting. And then a database that is publicly available uh, for everybody to go in uh, and look into. And this was a tissue atlas. It was down to cellular level. And the, 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 the groups that worked together was then the Swedish groups. And a, a key site was, was in Mumbai, India, where 19 pathologists were sitting and checking each and every slide. And, and this was some 13 million slides and annotate, tell actually where are the proteins expressed. So suddenly we had a map of at least down to cellular level. And the China site and the Seoul site were the rabbits that gave us the, the antibodies. And this was published, and a, a draft of almost all the proteins published in Science 2015. And just telling this story, and of course, with good references to the database, and it's close to 2,000 citations already, which I think is immensely. And now I'll talk so much about Matthias Ullén, so I thought I, I show uh, his face here. And it's that guy up in the corner, for those who haven't met him. Okay, but... The take-home message is, to summarize this very short, is that almost half of all the genes were expressed in all tissues. We didn't believe that. And very few proteins are unique to one tissue or cell type. And many drugs, tar drugs targets are localized to, to all tissues. And this last one, that tells us there is a real challenge, even if we know what genes, proteins that are screwed up for a specific disease to, to get a good, uh, good treatment for that. And then the story moved on that Matthias and Emma wanted to move into the cells and use something called confocal mi microscopy. And you then stain your antibody with a green color and you could look into the cells and check where are the proteins actually do, uh, doing their work inside the cells. Because then you come really close to the function. And here there was a really big challenge. They sort of split the cells into something like 30 compartments, and they wanted to have localization to this. But now it wouldn't do with 19 pathologists in India. There were basically not enough cell biologists around to do this. But if you're smart, you think outside the box. And I think this is a typical example. We could never have guessed what type of uh, people that will do, do a lot of this job. I think some of you know, what did Emma, who, who did she talk to? Online gamers. They sit by the computer and do stuff and get grades and move up and they love to do it. So she started talking with two uh, major producers of, of these MMO games and EVE Online is one of those. Is anybody here, have, have you played it? Because when I sp speak to high school students, half the <laughs> boys uh, raise their arm. Um, now Paul and Bjorn didn't dare to say that they do. But uh, And yeah, this is then what is called citizen science, that these uh, gamers sit and do annotations, and they qualify and get better and better. And of course, you don't put it directly into the database. There is a lot of curation and so on. 
And how do they learn cy cell biology? They go to, the, to school at Eve University, where Emma and her colleagues are teaching cell biology virtually. I think this is thinking outside the box. And, and, uh, and this is Emma's avatar in the game, and this is Emma in real life. And of course, what they do is that they save the world from these drifters. You can see just by looking at them that they are nasty. Uh, for the first six weeks, which was actually one and a half year, it was more than 50,000 gamers trying it, doing close to 8,000 classifications, spending 163 work years. At that time, they couldn't put it straight into the uh, into the database, but today they use a lot of it, and they top it with machine learning and so on. And this is getting getting there, and it's caused a lot of attention all over the world. Uh, and the database, as such, then they consist of the tissue atlas and the cell atlas, uh, has more than 200,000. Uh, s sessions per month, so it's not only that you go in and look, and it's more than uh, 200 countries that use it, and it's open access, no restrictions whatsoever, which is fantastic. And and last year, they, uh, and Emma has uh, made 12,000 of the 20,000 proteins, and now a first version of a pathology atlas, where you really link genes and proteins to specific cancers, for example. The first version was published in 2017, and this was version 18 then of the, of the human protein atlas. So now we have a, a tissue atlas, uh, a, a cell atlas, and a pathology atlas. But why has not the rest of the world done anything? Well, we will come to that. Uh, th this is now the plans, and I don't even want to spend time to go through it, but tissue, subcellular pathology, metabolic, blood, brain, microbiome. But now, suddenly, it's all happening at the same time. And now there is a lot of effort starting all around the world. The uh, Wallenberg uh, Foundation was this one, the pro and then Paul Allen, Microsoft, Facebook, Zuckerberg, Google, IBM. And the big question now is that, will this follow the thing to put it into public domain? I think they all have met at Scilife Lab, but I don't know who was part of the discussions and so on, because this is, of course, it's much, much better if we could share knowledge than to compete. And then I will end up with talking a little bit my, of my own subject, and that is uh, uh, protein drugs. Uh, the background here is that the small molecule drugs has dominated. That is what you typically found in your own closet at home. But then, um, over, over the last decades, the proteins have come more and more into focus. And you can say that over the si last 15 years, it's some call it the silent revolution. And the, uh, the most important type of protein therapeutics early on were the monoclonal antibodies. And the first one was introduced already in 85, and many people thought that it would go very fast to develop monoclonal antibodies to cure basically every disease. That was not the case, but still there is more than 50 on the global market. I think it's now 15 with rev revenues over 1 billion US dollar, telling us this, these, these are important to cure our diseases. Uh, and a monoclonal antibody is always, if you have forgotten your biology, sort of depicted as a Y, where this end binds its target. Still, fewer traditional monoclonal antibodies are induced. They will continue to be very important, but what, what you see today is that we get also antibody derivatives, and even more so bi- and multispecific uh, antibodies, that you link these together, by, um, by novel technology, so that you can actually use them. And I looked on a review just before the meeting. This is only one type of antibody derivatives, binding HER2, which is a breast cancer market, and CD3 on another arm, and then very, very man uh, variants. And CD3 is to, to bring in the immune system to, to do, do the work. And why is there so many? Yeah, here we come into IPR issues. Everybody wants to have their favorite one. That's part of the reason, at least. Anyway, and we have chosen a totally different way. Uh, and, and that is to use what we call small scaffold proteins and engineer them in this Lego type of way that we saw. 
And these are just four of the first ones, the adjecting, the affibodes, the antikalins, and the darpins. I think actually that we were the first, some 20 years ago, we devised the term affibody. And what we actually did was that it was uh, Matthias Ulleren again and Per Åker Nygren that say, why, why do we actually work with monoclonal antibodies? If you start looking at what they actually do, there is many times they just block or bind or sequester things in the body. Sometimes it has to do with the immune system, but then today you can bring that in by other means. So we took a protein that at least Björn Nilsson knows very well, Protein A, a very small protein, 58 building blocks, amino acid. And already on, on the early days, we actually knew the binding surface that protein A uh, used to bind its target. And then I remember Per Åke and Matthias discussing, if we changed every one of these 13 amino acids to the 19 others, and then we don't have a protein A scaffold anymore. Then we have a library of multitude of variants. The theoretical number is 10 to the 16, which we cannot handle in the lab, but the practical libraries we have today is 10 to the 10. And now we don't call them proteinase anymore, but AFI bodies. AFI, AFI for affinity of body, small body. And if we look at the time frame, what we have done, early on it was research and creating research tool, and the first products that came out on the market was biotech products. Later on it actually says diagnostics here, but now we have one of these problems changing to Mac. And, and the, here we meant also in vivo diagnostics, medical imaging type of applications, but later on we start treating these as possible protein therapeutics for the future. And our toolbox is very simple then. We have the antibodies that are engineered so we can get them to bind anything. They are small, stable, and flexible. We have optimized it further. So actually, we have 13 amino acid changed to get this binding surface. We have 11 more amino acid to make this protein more easy to produce in large scale and so on, also by chemical synthesis. But if we would use this as, as a therapeutic drug, we would pee it out very fast. A monoclonal antibody has an advantage of circulating maybe two to three weeks in the body, which you need to actually get it to work as a, as a drug. But we have solved that by then using a other, another small protein, albumin binding domain, which is even smaller, and it binds with enormous affinity, and then it extends circulation to two to three weeks. A simple tricks, we link these together genetically, and how, how does this actually, if we're now looking, trying to look into the future a little bit. What we first did was to select antibodies to this HER2 molecule, which is a marker for the most common breast cancer. Uh, and we got a very high affinity binder, and it's actually the four, four, fourth clinical testing now as a medical imaging device. So I would say that we are in late stage clinical testing. It's likely to come out both as a PET imaging and a SPET imaging spect imaging device. And in these studies, we find the same metastasis as with other methods in a very fast and rapid way. Th these move to the tumors very efficiently. And this particular woman, we found a brain tumor that we couldn't detect with any other method. And she has gone through surgeries living today. Five minutes, that's perfect. Then I can then do my dance move in the end as well. What this also gave us as a bonus, sort of, was that very many women then has been injected with antibodies, and we could see that we had uh, no side effects whatsoever. What also surprised us, that we, we didn't see any antibodies to these antibodies, and they are really small. So now we have continued with the cancer projects, and we have very many different approaches to it, but one is just to use the same type of antibody and, and link it to either radioactive uh, isotopes that is more to do radiotherapy at the tumor site, or actually uh, drugs, uh, what do we call it? Uh, tox toxic substances to bring a payload that you bring to the tumor. And these are both going on with excellent results in, 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 in mice, in preclinical testing. So we hope that this will give us drugs of that type in the not too far future. But we're also looking into other type of, of drugs. And uh, at the company Affibod AB, they have three products in clinical phase right now. 
One is a B cell autoimmunity disease and one is a liver disease. And I managed to borrow one of their ongoing phase two uh, slides on psoriasis, where it actually is then a double antibody capturing the bad guy IL-17A, and it binds with an extreme affini affinity sub-picomolar, for those of you are familiar, and then we use our friend ABD to prolong this in circulation. And for these patients, it's very evident to get the drug from having a very severe psoriasis with just one dose. After two weeks, they are basically doing good. And for those that know people with psoriasis, this could be a big one. So I hope that this could be a first protein drug of the scaffold type that then will bring, uh, bring us into the list. And this was a sort of unfair. It's five, the 15 top-selling pharmaceuticals. And unfortunately, one that there are not proteins were, were made white in this slice. But it's, it's not my fault. Uh, so 11 out of 15 are protein pharmaceuticals. Only one of these, Embrel, is one of these hybrid type of, of protein drugs. But I think that in 10 years, if we, if we look at this conference, then I think there will be a number that could be of this very novel type of protein <laughs> drugs. And here I'm done. This is what I started through. I took you through only a few of these and linked them together. And, and uh, I think now we see maybe even more exciting stuff with CAR-T technology and the genome editing stuff and so on. Thank you for the attention, uh, attention and thank you for arranging this fantastic thing. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions for Stefan? Yes. Uh, with the uh, DNA sequencing, uh, how is it um, uh, when different labs uh, sequence and they use different methods? Um, do they get uh, very different results? I don't think so. I, th uh, there was some group, at least I heard, that had compared the SciLife lab sequencing with the Be Be Beijing genome sequencing, which has actually a little bit lower price, and they were very happy with both of them. But I, I can also just follow up. I mean, they're, at SciLife, they're using Illumina sequencing, but mm. there are also some of these new technologies that Nanopore. are coming. At, yeah. Mm was that maybe the, the second drop in the cost. So I saw there was a huge drop when, mm. when NGS came out, and then recently there's been another yeah. quite steep drop, and maybe mm. that's the, the third generation technologies. I think so, but I'm not sure. I haven't no, heard that the quality is yeah. the same there, yeah, but, yeah. but it, it will probably be. Yeah. Uh, then I have uh, something that I would like to ask about the AFA body. So you, you mentioned that uh, this hybrid, these hybrid proteins are a new thing for therapy. Mm -hmm. And also that you've been working on alpha bodies since Bjorn Nielsen's time, mm -hmm. so a long time. Yeah, it's a it's 25 long. years, <laughs> hundred years maybe. Yeah, no. something like no. that. No, so so tw tw at least 20 years of development. Yeah. And so I, I just thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how you sell the alpha body. I mean, you, KTH has brought forward this technology, but there are many competitors. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you find that you have trouble getting recognition academically as well as uh, pushing it uh, to, to, to fu fund yeah, funders? It's a very good question. I can say from the beginning, I think some of the followers, so to, so to say, were quick at, quicker out on the market. But yeah. we, has, we have moved pretty slowly. And, and a key thing to move into humans was to create this ABD technology. And, and what we haven't talked a lot about is that that seemed to sort of hide the AFI body totally from the immune system. So now that technology as such is used by other pharmaceutical mm. companies with their protein drugs to sort of stealth their, their protein drugs. So that has been a key thing where I absolutely think we have an advantage now. And now the company is doing well. Yeah. We get a lot of propositions as academic people to do a lot of different things. Other companies are starting <laughs> using AFI bodies. I've seen, for example, Genentech. I'm pointing to you because you know Genentech. And, and uh, one, uh, now I don't find the Korean uh, company that also sort of have their AFI bodies yeah. very similar to us. Yeah. Probably trying to get around, around the IPR. But yeah. anyway, th I think there is space out there. And the new thing is also that you start using things that bring in the immune system that is pretty similar as what you have done before by, by the monoclonal antibodies yeah. next sort of next mm. generation. Mm. Mm. I think that there is, a, I mean, you also touched on this with the Cell Atlas, that you have comp almost competing projects now in, in, in the US and mm. in UK as well now. But you, you said that maybe it's good to share the data instead of, instead of to 
have your own special project. I think so. Maybe there's a lot of o overlap there. I mean, yeah. it's not my field, but it, it no, seems no, that... No, I uh, think everybody would benefit because there's still the, the enemy is the diseases that we want to cure people from. And uh, sometimes you lose track of that maybe, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, sometimes the enemy is Stanford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, it was yeah, for a while, yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, talking about Stanford, you know where uh, Emma is now? Yeah, it's yeah. been Stanford, <laughs> yeah. Sad. No. <laughs> uh, Zuckerberg is up, yeah. <laughs> Uh, are there any more questions for Stefan Steele? Bjorn yeah. pointed that out, that your last name is actually Steele. It's very <laughs> fitting that you're here then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks.